Powers. Blocked by Marino. Mindfulness is all, all about being aware exactly what is happening in the present moment. You guys have a bunch of conflict going on between you. A team is like an orchestra, right? And everybody's playing their instruments and you're trying to create harmony. And if people are fighting against each other, it's going to sound terrible. And that's what happened in the last game. You guys have come so far and you let these little bickering uh, problems with each other totally sink your ship. I want you guys to put into your minds right now anything that you're actually specifically frustrated, any person you're actually specifically frustrated on this team, anything you're pissed off about. I want you to breathe in and think about it, and when you breathe out, see if you can actually let it go. I want you all to have your hands on this as one team. I don't want you to let go of this until you feel like you're able to let go of any of the anger that you have towards the team. If you're feeling pissed, hold on tight and see if you can start trying to let it go. Forgive a little bit. You guys need to be able to, to say to forgive anybody specifically in order to let go of this. You can name that. And no matter what's happened, I did or anything, everything behind me now, I got your back no matter what. All right? On the court, off the court. Oakland, California is becoming the focal point for a new movement in education. In 2007, Park Day, a private school in Oakland, began teaching a mindfulness curriculum. The program, called Mindful Schools, was a response to the stresses of growing up in a city with one of the highest rates of violent crime in the U.S. The mindfulness teachers began to work all over Oakland in the schools with the most need. Based on age-old practices of breathing and attuning the senses, mindfulness is used to calm and focus the mind. It helps kids to deal with anger, frustration, and conflict. Various teachers have created a number of exercises to help students develop mindfulness. Mindful listening, Mindful eating, the vacuum breath. And then when you breathe it, we'll let it all go. <sighs> Let's do it a few times. Sending kind and caring thoughts. And we'll start with ourselves. May I be healthy and strong. Visualization. <laughs> and catching butterfly thoughts.
Kids growing up in America today have daunting challenges in their lives. This is the story of several young people using mindfulness practices to face these challenges. school going throughout high school I had a lot of anger inside I didn't know how to release it so I used to like punch walls in throw tantrums get really mad start lashing my anger out on different people I was involved in this game we went around harassing people and stealing and banging and graffiti and I realized that I don't want to get led to that path of destruction and going to jail, selling drugs, trying to kill people, or being poor, or being a crackhead, and I don't want to end up like that. When I was in middle school, that was like the phase when I was kind of dressing like a dude, but then like kind of not. I wrote about this girl, because I really, really liked her, and like I wrote a poem about her. It wasn't a safe environment. Certain type of people would make fun of me, call me names. One time, this guy, he had took a hoodie, so he took it and he wrapped it around my neck and I couldn't breathe and I was trying to call the teacher. Some of the students came up to me and was like, are you okay? And like, they made fun of me. And so I went to like a deep depression and like to the point I couldn't look myself in the mirror. I will live to be 21, I won't be a punk. You think you know me, you can't even see me. I'm like Casper, I float around in these streets looking for peace, can't find peace. All I see is these dirty ass streets. I walk around wondering, will I get popped or dropped? I don't know, I just go with the flow like they say. Just relax and let it go. Hell no, how can I do that when I'm always worried about getting jacked? All this cracking drugs on the street, thugs only get one heartbeat because they can't get two because their time is due. So one of the things that happened this fall was one of the students came in and said, we think we might know who did it, who might have killed, and I didn't know who he was talking about. He goes, it was one of your students who you had in second grade. Then the parents came in. It was their only child, and they wanted for the child to succeed immensely. So they put everything into their child. And so he goes to the middle school, and he gets shot, and the child gets he's dead. They're used to seeing their homes get vulgarized drug sales around the school. Within those blocks, prostitution, violence in the sense that people get shot, friends that they know get shot. This Tuesday, my friend died the day before. Mm, he died walking to his house with friends. He got shot one time and with that bullet he died. Everyone knows that it was gang related. So there's always this constant fear as to what's going to happen and there's a constant tension. What was the, the emotion that you had about it? Mad. And if you uh, didn't have mindfulness, what would your reaction maybe have been? Probably pick a fight with somebody or do something stupid. I was, I got out the shower, I sat in my bed, and then I just sat down, closed my eyes again, and then I was just breathing, listening to my breathing, how it went. And then, like, I fell asleep, so I fell asleep. <laughs> how do you cope with this? Not just to react, and it creates the space, it's like a buffer zone. So I think that mindfulness does that. It makes, it gives you the space to think about, it gives them the space to think about how to respond to things differently. 
And many of them really liked having the space where they were just quiet and they can just um, be and not be pushed to be somewhere a certain time, demanded and not required to be somewhere. It really worked for them. After doing some mindfulness and mindful listening, how does your body feel? How do you feel right now? Even though it was a year ago that I taught you these things, you guys are still really able to be using them. You feel like if you're, you're in a pillow sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is hurting you and you're feeling really relaxed. Like nothing's hurting you and you're feeling really relaxed. That sounds good. And I fight with my sister. Huh. Wow. Yeah, that's important. So what do you do when you... How, how do you use mindfulness then? I breathe three times. As soon as you get angry, if you're not mindful of your anger, there's nothing wrong with anger, but if you're not mindful of the anger, then all of a sudden you go into a reaction, the anger's got you, and then you're its slave. And there are a lot of people in prison because one moment of anger and they lost their minds and did something that was irreversible. And remember that mindfulness is not about feeling good. It's just about noticing how you, how you are feeling. It was really important for us to bring a mindfulness practice into this school. When I say go, I want you to close your hand into a fist, but before you close it, I want you to see if you can notice that there's a moment in your mind where you have to decide to move. Knowing that the reason why so many young people in our city are killing each other is that they don't know what else to do when they feel hurt or angry or disrespected or frustrated. It has become so normalized, jump to violent action, it's out of control. And so we knew that we wanted to bring in some kind of a tool and a practice for our kids to develop another option. So mindfulness brought me a whole new perspective. It calmed me and um, helped like release all the anger and negativity out and to release my feelings and emotions. Mindfulness actually helps you relax and think about the problem and think about a solution to the problem and think about if you, if you reacted in, in a negative way, what would be the solution to that or what would happen next. Anybody want to tell me what they heard or what they felt? I felt like moving around. Mm -hmm. So your body like wanted to move? Yeah. yeah. I'm happy because I controlled with my body. Isn't that cool? She said she was happy that she was able to control her body. You always have that choice. Sometimes you want to do something, maybe you get upset, you want to like push somebody. You're actually able to control it. You're able to feel the impulse, the word impulse means the feeling that you want to do something, and then you're able to see, oh, I, can, I have a choice. I can do that, or if I want, I don't have to. And it feels good to know that you have that choice, right? Cool. I purposely went into science thinking ultimately I wind up in what's now called neuroscience and the neuroscience of consciousness. But along the way, I uh, began to study the martial arts and yoga and meditative practices and from various traditions and I began to realize that they knew something that I just didn't understand about cultivating awareness. Another way to study the mind is to actually study your own mind. And there are disciplines that have evolved over the entire course of humanity in all of the various traditions and cultures for studying one's own mind and cultivating a certain amount of calmness, clarity, equanimity, kindness in regard to living life uh, ethically in a way that causes the least harm and generates the most benefit, not just for oneself, but for other people.
is Daniel, and I'm going to be teaching you guys mindfulness, um, which is a technique that has a bunch of different applications in sports, especially for high-level athletes, for focus, for relaxation, for team cooperation. Should have beat them, and um, in the locker room after the game, everyone was yelling, was really cussing. Like, you should have did this. You should have did that. If you complain coming off the bench, take my fucking starting spot right now. Whoever wants that right now, take it. We all wanted to win that game. I was upset knowing that we could have won, but knowing that there was nothing we could do about it now, and it was a pass. Things were horrible. Everyone was yelling at each other. Um, There's like no communication between the coaches and players. There's a lot of talent on the team, but it wasn't being put to use. That was one of the low points of the season. We were just yelling at each other and no one was getting along. Friends were no longer friends. We lacked mental toughness. After a loss, are we gonna break apart or are we gonna come together? Double cross the man with me. It gets you really aware of your body. So we'll do some exercises where we're really focusing in and feeling in the different sensations in our body, feeling the movement in our bodies. What are the, the things that you need in order to be a really good player? Be a team player. Unselfish. So we'll work on communication. That's a lot of what mindfulness is as well, is actually being able to be aware of what's going on all around you. Sometimes we can get really stuck in our mind at like how we're doing, trying to impress the crowd trying to do whatever you know your, your, your dribbling is instead of actually co opening up your awareness, knowing where all your players are, knowing what's going on. Attitude. Passion, attitude. So that's a really important one, right? So that's another thing we're going to look at. Like you can talk about confidence, which is a big one I know when I'm playing basketball. It's really easy for me if I start missing some shots, to start getting down on myself. Joe, what? Ooh, Joe, Joe. Joe, don't put the ball in there. And I start like getting into a bit of a funk while I'm playing. And then you probably know, we get into a zone and you're just like in that place of feeling your passion, feeling your confidence, and you're just lighting it up, right? Because the, the mindset, the way you're feeling inside, totally affects how you're shooting. More so than, you, than if you've practiced for hours taking your foul shots. If you're just like really confident, it's really important. It seemed like at a certain point, this is what I would love to do as my work, is to actually train other people in this kind of thing uh, to deal with stress, pain, illness, and then ultimately to be able to study the effects of uh, mindfulness on people suffering in this kind of way and seeing whether we couldn't learn something fundamental about the mind-body connection, about its relationship to health and well-being, about emotion regulation. Well, I had run away for the second time. For all my life, I was a happy kid and I would think that I would grow up to be such a happy person. And then next thing I know, I'm trying to commit suicide because I'm feeling so bad. And it, it just felt so unreal. It felt like I was living in a song by an indie band. And even more so when I took the pills, I, I felt like I wasn't me. And then when I woke up in the hospital, I felt like, oh my God, what have I done? I was living with my biological father and I would just be like, why can't you love me for who I am? And I'd always want to try to make him proud of me. And 
then I started looking for that love in other people. And whenever I got my heart broken, it was devastating. That's when I started trying to upset my father because I needed to get out of there. My boyfriend at the time, he would say he loved me. That meant a lot to me. But he wanted to have sex with me. And I was only 14, he was 16, and I said no. But we kept kissing, and when I kept saying no, he finally just said, you know what, I'm gonna take what you won't give. It's very hard to catch a butterfly. And our thoughts, our thoughts in our mind are as fast as butterflies. And today we're gonna catch our butterfly thoughts. So can everybody get out their butterfly net? Now take one hand on your belly and take one hand and hold your butterfly net. Let your eyes close and start to do your mindful breathing and keep your butterfly net still unless you're gonna catch a butterfly, unless there's a thought. And then when you catch your thought, let it go and bring your attention back to your breathing. There's a the kind of an affectionate attention, a kind of elemental kindness that we have to ourselves. And then that can be cultivated as well so that it creates greater self-confidence, greater emotional balance, greater emotional intelligence. If you, if you feel sad or like you feel kind of grumpy, this is so smart of you. If you feel sad or grumpy, do you like being sad and grumpy? No. Would you, would you rather let it go? Yes. I think that if I had just stepped back and viewed my thoughts as thoughts, I wouldn't have taken the pills. It really took a lot to wake me up, but as soon as I started being my own person and not thinking too hard on things, I started being grateful that I was alive. I would just start thinking to myself, look at your thoughts go by as thoughts. This train of thoughts is what's helped me the most. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we could teach kids when they haven't yet gotten so caught up in the stream of thought and fear, thoughts like, I'm no good, or, I'm unworthy, or I'm stupid, or I'm fat, and you realize those are thoughts, those are not necessarily true, but they can be incredibly toxic and self-fulfilling prophecies, but if you just back away from them, then they're like gurgles in the stream. You are the capacity to ride on the waves of the mind and, and the emotional reactivity and navigate through the ups and the downs in ways that have greater balance, greater clarity, greater equanimity, and greater insight. So it's actually a way to nurture core intelligences. I'm angry because, well, my dad died. And it was, of, he died of cancer. It was for like two years. He was battling it and he couldn't, then I guess it didn't work that well. It kind of made me feel better because it's just like, oh, my dad died in a day. It just kind of feels like, oh my god, I'm so, like, kind of just like bitter. Like it's just a bitter day. Like there's no light. It's just only darkness that's coming in. It's like the world was ending. It just felt like my family was full, but now it went down and now it's not full again. I remember in the morning before where I left, he would be me like a big circle around daddy. Right here. It's okay, mom. 
we all sang stuff about him and saying how nice he was, and we also did that <coughs> at school. A lot of people who even didn't know him still were crying because I think death is a horrible thing. I deal with missing my dad and feeling really sad with mindfulness. It helps me a lot just to be able, just to help me just feel like a notice. And a lot of time I'll just talk to him while I'm like sitting or something. And I'll talk to him just not like he's really not there, but like I just, I just feel like I can talk to him. mindfulness in real life situations and it does help with my parents because um, me and my parents get into conflicts a lot. Sometimes I'm feeling all stressed like why isn't my mom getting what I'm trying to say and she's yelling at me. I don't want to block the feeling because then I'm just making a dam and then it's just gonna explode out one time and I just let it flow until it just flows all out, just like a river or something. I imagine how she might be feeling. I find that when you stop being mean to the other person and you start being nice towards their yelling, it sort of stops them from being mad because it's hard to be mad when someone else is being nice back. I think that the way that I use mindfulness has helped us as a family, just come together. I have to go to sleep a lot. You have to sleep? Yeah. Because I mean, it, it, uh, it relaxes me, so I might as well. Yeah. Ever happened when you're on the foul line? You ever try that? I did. It helped. It helped? It helped. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to lie. It helped. It helped. <laughs> it's, it's weird, though, that it would help, but it, it, it helps. I can't lie, at first we thought it was kind of like a joke, you know, it was kind of like, oh, we don't, like, it's going to another distraction, like, something like that, but honestly, I think it has really helped us. If you actually imagine taking a shot, so like imagining it lifting off your fingers, flying up, swishing down through the net, it actually works on the same neural pathways, it works in the same place as your brain, as if you're taking like a hundred practice shots. It does the same thing just if you're imagining it. So letting your eyes close again, feeling your body and letting, imagining the ball perfectly. It was new to me being taught a mindful technique and stuff because they don't teach you that in school or anything. So I thought it'd be new, like a new challenge and I was willing to take it on. So yeah, it turned, it's turned out pretty good so far. And anything that has to do like, if it's gonna help you think better, it wouldn't be a distraction. I didn't see any way I could hurt us really. Senior year, like this year, I averaged double digit points, double digit rebounds every game just about. Since I learned mindfulness, I'm pretty sure my stats have went up even a little bit higher. Let's all close our eyes. When you close your eyes, it kind of like opens the satellite dish up. Starting right now, just listening. When I'm in practice, I can just hone my skills. I can notice what I'm doing wrong on my shot when I use mindfulness and stuff. And it'll help me like fix the little things in my game that those things that matter the most though when it comes out. And then as a team, mindfulness, like how it's evolved me as a team, it makes me more, I don't get as mad with players now, like the other players, like the younger ones when they like make big mistakes and stuff, but I don't yell at them anymore. I just, I just like calm myself down. I just, I'll take them to the side, talk to them or talk to them, tell them what they did wrong and make sure they understand and stuff. all started playing basketball because it was fun. It's a fun game. You get to run around with your friends, you get to shoot, and then you start playing a lot and you start having to run these suicides and do all this work and it stops being that much fun. It starts being really stressful. You're kind of judging yourself up against other people. 
how to get that feeling in your body again of, oh yeah, I'm out here to run around and play some basketball. Because when you can feel like that, that's when you're actually a lot better. And if you're playing relaxed and having fun, that's when uh, you get in the zone. I brought something to, to practice with. They're kind of like mini basketballs. Usually when I eat one of these, like I peel it apart and I like eat the whole thing. But what we're gonna do is eat this thing as if we've never had it before. It's amazing, we're gonna explore it. Just take a minute as if you're like um, a scientist looking at it. Like looking it up in the light. Really get like, what is this thing you're holding in your hand? Polka dots in it. Yeah, a little polka dot. One of the real secrets of why I'm teaching you mindfulness, the most important piece of it is actually teaching me how to enjoy my life. something you really like, often our mind jumps around so much we don't actually get to enjoy it, to taste it. Before, when we used to lose, before we had learned mindfulness as a team, we kind of accepted it more. Like, oh, we lost, it's okay, you know, there's next game. And we'd be down on ourselves, but nobody really took it to the next level. After we started learning mindfulness, when we lose, we probably were mad for about 20 minutes, maybe 30. We kind of just calmed ourselves down. We would text each other and be like, oh, we lost because of this. And everybody would be like, yeah, I noticed that too, after just thinking about it. You win five games and then you lose one. It's hard, but you know it's gonna come to an end at one point, and it's just how you recover. And I feel like mindfulness has put everyone in that position where it's just like, okay, so we'll just pick up and we can start another winning streak back up again. When I dunk, I mean, when you go up in the air, you feel like there's nobody around, just just you, the ball, and the rim. I visualize it. I just, you know, slow down, visualize catching the ball, jumping where I'm gonna jump from, what I'm gonna do once I jump, if I need to like take contact. Once I leave the ground, it's just, I'm in the zone, like, like an airplane, like just in space, just nothing around you, just me. Uh, the Hercules game where we played at home, and it was, a, it was a close game, and pretty much whole game, and it was intense, especially in the last two or three minutes. After that, like the whole momentum of the game just changed from that point. That was after like, a month or two of mindfulness, and we had just learned a couple of the like visualizing techniques. Here. Daniel just talked to us about it. I'm not sure if I even would have ran up the court after uh, after the ball if I, I probably didn't visualize like what happened and afterwards all the good things that would happen instead of the bad things like him missing and stuff like that. But yeah, that's just one of the ways of. Uh, Mindfulness has helped us in a like critical game. It's just the same with skateboarding, where I just take a couple breaths to get that frustration out of my way so I can clear my mind and do my work right.
like skateboarding. It just brings me and my friends together to do something that we all love. Yeah, I don't have that many injuries. No broken bones yet or anything. When I'm skateboarding, sometimes I get a little bit frustrated when I'm trying to do a trick and I don't land it. And so I try it again and again and again. And so I notice that I'm frustrated and I learn the vacuum breath where you, you just like suck all that feeling of anger into your breath and then just, just breathe it out. It helps me just calm down. And then after I do the vacuum breath, I find that it's a lot easier for me to do the trick and land it. I got a wonderful feeling. My baby's gonna treat me right. that zone where you're like unstoppable yeah. so I just want to be put into that zone like constantly so yeah you can take any kind of stress or nervousness that you might have and you're gonna like breathe it all the way into your belly and hold it there for like two or three seconds and then when you breathe out you're just gonna like totally let your whole body relax <sighs> mindfulness is it's it's breathing and it's it's relaxation and it's forgetting that anyone's even on the court. It's just the ball, you, and the lights that are turned on inside a gym. When I'm in the zone, basketball-wise, it's just like I could shoot and I'm shooting in an ocean. And I, there's no way I can miss. The ocean's too big. I almost feel like I could just throw it up there and it might just go in because it's just that kind of day. And mindfulness puts me there. kids have learned mindfulness techniques so they can actually bring stability and clarity to their own mind. The course of their life is different. The stability and clarity of being able to stay present and let emotions arise and fall without getting, being swept up by them, you're giving them a life skill that helps them move deeply into an inner clarity that is an invitation for meaning and connection, both with oneself and with other people. When I started to go to Midwest, it was non-homophobic. So it was like a really good community to be in. At first I was kind of nervous, but then I overcame it. Back in like third grade, I was tomboy. You know, I played with the guys, I played football. So I see myself as like transgender youth. I don't like to hide like the truth. I would like to like bring it out to the table. Some people think it's too spirited, like a two spirited person. Back like in the old days when like when the Indians and like the Africans were like in their countries, so they looked at um, transgender people as two spirited people as a man spirit and a woman spirit put together in one body and they looked at that as the closest thing to God so like back then transgender people were like treated with lots and lots of respect now mindfulness has helped me block out the negative thoughts I feel myself more comfortable like saying what I actually am <laughs> 
Part of why we see academic achievement flatline in high school is that our kids don't know how to focus and stick with a really difficult problem. When we ask them to do more and more difficult math problems, they give up. They never stick with it for long enough to get over that frustration and actually experience the incredible satisfaction of having figured something out. Mindfulness has helped with grades a lot because when I was angry, I would like stop with my work. I was like, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't care. But now, if I got an F now, I would like go over it and try to redo it to earn a better grade. Before I even knew about mindfulness, I was doing bad in math class. And then um, when everybody was out of school, I came back to uh, retake my math class and I passed it. So I got all my math credits. If I didn't know about mindfulness, I'm like, so what? I don't care. Rest, two, ready, play. I was very impressed when I was teaching in China that uh, the the Chinese calligraphy for mindfulness is the character for presence over the character for heart. So one of the things is if you hear the word mindfulness and you're not hearing heartfulness too, you're not really understanding what mindfulness is. It's not some cold clinical thing about the mind. It's about understanding uh, the, the heart of the matter and that is that mind and heart are one and that emotions and feelings are an incredibly important part of the human repertoire. Have you taught your family any types of mindfulness? Have you ever? Imagínense los que se sienten seguros, con paz, saludables y felices. ¿Qué es eso? 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 ¿Qué es eating raisins. She gave me the last raisin. And I realized that I had been eating without being mindful. And I kept that raisin. <laughs> Everybody was asking me, why do you have that raisin? Are you really insane? And I was just like, no, this is my mindfulness raisin. This is the raisin that has saved my life. Because it's like that one last raisin could be that one last pill. It's the same with a thought. If you give one thought that much power, it has just that much power over you. The studies of brain changes with mindfulness practice come in two forms. One is from people who have been practicing mindfulness for tens of thousands of hours of meditation. Meditation and mindfulness, meditation and other forms of compassion training. And those people had an amazing finding that uh, Richie Davidson found, which is a left shift. Massive emphasis on the left hemisphere, frontal area, which in Richie's view um, is both an area of positive emotions, so this idea of happy life, but it's also the approach state, so you approach difficult things instead of withdrawing from them. But the other kind of studies also show the same left shift, not to the same degree, of people who have just been learning mindfulness for eight weeks and have never had any period of thousands and thousands of hours of training. So even with this small amount of eight-week training when they've been practicing at home, the left shift was found to a certain degree, and the degree of that left shift 
correlated with the improvement in immune function of those individuals' blood flow. So in other words, if you have this left shift from mindfulness practice, it correlates directly with your improvement in how you fight off illness. So this is evidence for, number one, the idea that mindfulness improves even with just an eight-week practice, and number two, that it affects the brain and the whole physiology of the person. You guys play sometimes as if you'd be like one body, like one of you guys is the arm, one of you guys is the leg, you guys are one, one body um, working together. So let's just get something where like, let's all move left, all right, and just get the feeling how it's like together, um, you're, you guys are creating something. You guys are working it down the, the court. You guys are individuals. You guys are all doing your own mindfulness, and then you feel it together. So you're stepping out there in like a really uh, fierce way. So we can uh, actually <coughs> drop down and do this for each other. You guys ready? OK, on three, we're going we're gonna to drop it. Ready? So one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> you guys scare each other? We talked about this before. If you win this game today, you'll have two wins in NCS. Not one Alameda High School team has ever won two NCS games in one year. Not one. If we win this game, we go to NorCal. We're going to win again in someone's house. Let's yeah. go. Come on. Family yeah. on three. One, two, three. Family! Family. helps you think and it clears all the thoughts out your mind just lets you focus on that one thought that you want to focus on whereas without mindfulness you know you got a bunch of thoughts in your head you're probably thinking about what you're going to eat for dinner what you had last week what you're going to do this weekend or whatever whereas now it's just like you're thinking about those things but as soon as you start to just use the mindfulness techniques as we learned you just focus in on that one thought like why we lost or how it felt to win or what we did wrong in practice or whatever you know, you have a big test coming up, just calming yourself down, and when, when you're actually taking the test, just keeping your nerves down, you know, I could do this, and having that same confidence like you would if you're playing a basketball game. You just have that confidence, like, I'm bigger than the test, I could, I could complete this. <laughs> Phil Jackson, I talked to Phil Jackson. We're gonna go to a Lakers shoot around. We're gonna get to um. Damn. I'm sorry. Come on, guys. Welcome, guys. How are you? Here. I know you went through some of the training. How'd you use your uh, mindfulness, Danny? Using our eyes to focus. Using our ears to really get in some samurai awareness skills, becoming more aware of our bodies, getting really grounded, taking a charge, how you can actually feel like you're a mountain when you're, when you're doing this. So as we were going through, um, our team actually got farther than it's ever gotten 
um, it's in its whole entire history. I'll see you there at the arena today. We use kind of like a rooted thing where we, you know, visualize a safe spot for guys. They have their own particular safe spot, whether it's in their kid's bed when they're a kid with a blanket sucking on their thumb or something, you know, whatever their safe spot is. And so they can kind of draw strength from that. So some of the keys that we try to teach these guys about the pressure of the game and how to relax, timeouts, come in, sit down, use your safe spot, take a breath, clear yourself. Before their fourth and final playoff game, the Alameda High basketball team was in shambles. The previous day in practice, everyone's emotions coming out. It almost is like people were bottled up inside for three years and then they just let everything out that practice. It's just always gonna be a rivalry between the older guys and younger guys. Nobody wants to sit on the bench. It's just pure emotion and people just finally speaking their minds on the issues we had. It was just a bunch of anger and built up between us. We had a couple of people get in little arguments and little tussles. We were almost not going to go up. That's how bad it was. It was almost like we weren't, we weren't going to play. And imagine that you make it there, offer you not to play because of some high school drama. Someone told this to someone and someone hearing this from someone and almost as if it was betrayal within our team. Families they tell each other things with trust, knowing that, you know, it's not going to be told to someone else or, you know, spread around school. The exercise Daniel did was, was very, very big. Um, it, I think it kind of let everyone's emotions fly out the window and focus on the game. That was what we needed to hear from uh, Dustin when he stepped up and what he said. It was like a big hug for everyone. It was just something reassuring knowing that he recognized what he did and, you know, he's taking responsibility. Despite what was said, we still need to be together for this game. That exercise where we are hanging onto the bar was just, we, I think we won it right there. No doubt we wanted to win, but knowing that if everyone gave it 100% and we came up short, it was a privilege to be there and no one expected us to be there from the very beginning. And we won the inner game right before we took the floor when that was addressed. It, w it was won. I, I like that. Uh, it's a victory inside itself. Even though we lost, everybody was like at peace with each other. Like everybody knew like we lost, but inside, like we had won. Like we just won like everybody's friendship back. Even though we probably, we won't play together again like most of us, but regardless of what happened before and stuff, we were all, it was behind us. In, we were all like family. I remember the day that Daddy died and you had gone to school and then you called Emily on her phone to see if she wanted to come do a mindful walk with you in the garden. Something like there were leaves that died, but there were new leaves that came in. And like, and there was also new like flowers and everything. And I remember that there was this one plant that was like this, and then the next day we went in and it was like this, and it then it started sprouting a lot. And we kept noticing that and everything kept changing. I liked when you were saying about noticing the leaves and then the, the plants sprouting. Life ends and life begins all at the same time. It reminds me of that book, The Fall of Freddie the Leaf. Yes. About, it's about death and, and uh, rebirth and Freddie the it's Leaf is a leaf. Who, yes, who doesn't want to fall off the tree but eventually it's time and the leaves become mulch for the new growth in the spring. And, and then the, the and oldest, wisest leaf tells him that when you fall, it's fine. It just means that you're going to be hoping new things come again just like uh, worms do.
I teach mindfulness to second and third graders. Like they'll get into a conflict and then like they'll call each other names and one of them end up crying and like the other one's all mad, start laughing. So now I take like one of those kids out to pra practice mindfulness and like after that their friends right back over again. Yeah, and how do you deal with the craziness? Because uh, exercise is a really good way of relieving stress too. I'll eat fast and then I won't eat, and then I'll eat a lot, and then I won't eat. <laughs> and so my mom would tell me, breathe if I'm eating fast, and I would be like, hey, I am breathing. That's pretty awesome. Nobody else has the same breathing as you. It's like your fingerprint. And I just, I like it because my breath is mine and every time I hear it, I'm making myself real.